you know, when you're living through history, you often don't realize that what you're experiencing is a historic event. I think if you read the history books and you see people who were involved in things that ultimately turned out to be historic, rarely, with few exceptions, did they realize that what they were doing was something that was historic. We are living through one of a less than a handful of the most devastating pandemics ever to confront human civilization. Count them. Pandemic flu of 1918, 50 million people died in one year. It was acute and it was self-limited. It didn't linger. Smallpox, the plague, HIV. So if you look at, count on one hand, we happen to be living through something that very few generations lived through, that certainly very few public health officials and scientists lived through, where you are fighting a disease that is continuing to rage and kill people, and we have very little to do about it, except for the great success in therapy. But, interestingly, therapy is something that is unusual compared to other diseases. It has to be given for life, and there's a real problem in access in the developing world. Now, in 2009, with PEPFAR, with the Global Fund, with the Clinton and Gates Foundation, Net Sans Sans Frontier, there are over three million people. Having said that, three million people are receiving effective antiretroviral therapy. Having said that, of all the people in low and middle income countries who need therapy, 30% are getting them. For every one person we put on therapy, two to three people get newly infected. So we're faced with a very dramatic situation. Despite the spectacular success of therapy, the epidemic is out of control. So if this were something else where we finally got the cure for whatever it is, I mean, childhood leukemia, which is now, if you get it, a certain type of childhood leukemia is 95% curable. Childhood leukemia was a very dreaded thing years ago. There's not an epidemic of childhood leukemia. There's the same number of people getting childhood leukemia. And when they get it, we treat them, and 95% of the time they get better. How would you feel if every time you treated a child with childhood leukemia, three of them got childhood leukemia and you couldn't get to them? That's sort of the same sort of thing we're dealing with with HIV. The spectacular success of therapy is being muted and dampened by the fact that we can't get therapy to people quick enough. So what's the answer? The answer is prevention. And what is prevention? Prevention is a lot of things. One of the things prevention is, is vaccine. You go to places like Sub-Saharan Africa and you see the devastation. That has a very, very powerful motivating force. For the first time in my medical career, I actually got goose pimples and I said, oh my God, this is an infectious disease, but why is it only in gay men at this point in time? So as the disease started to unfold, in July and August and more cases were being reported. I decided in the summer of 1981 that I would change the direction of my laboratory and I would focus only on this unusual disease which was called at the time gay-related immunodeficiency or GRID. And I started admitting patients to my ward and I started to study what I could study about them. We didn't know it was a virus. We didn't have a virus. It was acting like a virus and it was destroying the immune system. And my mentor, Shelley Wolf, when he heard about this, he, he, he called me up on the phone. He said, what is this I hear you're going to start admitting gay men with, remember it was all gay men at the time, with this strange disease? There's only 40 of some of them that are reported, 40 or 50 people. Why are you going to be doing that? You're crazy. You have such a great career in front of you. He said, do me a favor. You're a good person. I know you. You've got good judgment. Study HIV AIDS, but don't give up your day job. Well, I did give up my day job and stopped studying the things I was studying, and essentially I've been full-time studying HIV in the lab until 1984, 
when I became director of the institute. And then from that vantage point, I continued my studies, which I still do up to today, in studying HIV pathogenesis. But I jump-started the institute and said, we got to get on this. Uh, a lot of infectious disease people got angry with me that the new director of NIAID is now putting all of this money into AIDS. At the time, it was $160 million. Now we're spending, appropriately, $2.9 billion a year at the NIH on, on AIDS. But it was at that time that people were thinking we were taking it away from other infections because this is just a curiosity of a disease. It's not a major public health impact. And then history, as you know, has shown that that is absolutely not the case. Vaccines, in general, classic vaccinology, is based on the premise that we see what the body does in natural infection and we try to mimic it. And I call that the classic vaccinology proof of concept. Namely, if you look at smallpox, polio, measles, hepatitis, you name it, the, the diseases for which we've had successful vaccines, nature, i.e. natural infection, proves the concept for the vaccinologist and says, although some people die, some people get ill, at the end of the day, the vast majority of people not only are cleared of infection, they eradicate the infection, and they're protected, usually lifelong, against subsequent challenge. So all we vaccinologists have to do is to develop a vaccine that mimics natural infection. We were focusing on the classic paradigm, which is understandable, because as a matter of fact, that's how vaccines have been developed for decades and decades and decades. As we were developing vaccines, we started to see that some of those classic paradigms didn't hold, like it was very difficult in the natural state to develop neutralizing antibodies. Nobody, essentially nobody, eradicated the virus from their body. There's a small percentage, less than 5% of long-term non-progressors who can seem to control virus replication very, very well with essentially undetectable virus. But inevitably, the virus progresses, the disease progresses, and the immune response is inadequate. Most of the time, when you develop vaccines the way we've had for a variety of other viruses and other microbes, that when you do it, you see an immune response, you hope it's going to be protective, and it turns out to be protective, but you're not really sure why it's protective. Now that we're hitting stone walls in lack of success for these various candidates, both the envelope candidates and now the T-cell vaccine candidates, only now are we really going and looking at things that we were beginning to learn years ago, namely that this is a very, very strange virus with some properties that no other virus that we've ever confronted has.